Rapid digitalization during the COVID-19 pandemic is expanding opportunities for digital services trade. Cross-border services are increasingly delivered online instead of physically. These include financial, legal, information and telecommunications, health, education, and other business services. Digital services trade can contribute to economic welfare and development. There are many potential synergies between digital services trade and other sectors. Growth in digital services trade in Asia and the Pacific is among the highest in the world. However, digital services trade as a share of total services trade in Asia still has room to grow. Closing the gap requires improving competitiveness in digital services. The region needs to invest more in human capital and ICT infrastructure. Policy and regulatory reforms are the key to higher competitiveness. International cooperation can reduce barriers to digital services trade, promote system interoperability, and ensure fair taxation. Challenges must also be overcome to realize the full potential of digital services trade. Economic and social inequality between those with and without digital skills may worsen. Growing digital services trade calls for renewed attention to cybersecurity and privacy. What does it take to ensure that digital services trade contributes to inclusive growth in Asia and the Pacific? To find out, read the latest Asian Economic Integration Report. As uh, you saw from the video just now, in today's Asian Impact webinar, we'll be discussing digitalization in Asia and the Pacific. It's a theme topic in the Asian Development Bank's Asian Economic Integration Report released today. Now, this is an annual report that lays out the status of regional cooperation and integration in Asia and the Pacific, as well as looking at key areas of focus. Now, to present on the findings of today's report, we have with us Albert Park. He's the chief economist uh, here at the Asian Development Bank. Then we'll be opening up to questions, so please do put those in the Q&A box. So if I can hand the virtual microphone to you now, please, Albert. Thank you, Karen. It's my pleasure to present the key findings of the 2022 Asian Economic Integration Report. The AEIR is an annual publication that reviews the trends of regional trade, investment, migration, and tourism in Asia and the Pacific in order to provide an updated picture of the region's economic development and integration efforts. Over the past two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely disrupted global trade and supply chain investment decisions and the flow of people, heightening the importance and interest in this year's findings. The report also features a theme chapter on advancing digital services trade in Asia and the Pacific. And you just saw a video summary of that uh, special theme chapter. And this chapter is also very timely given the acceleration of digital transformation and increased importance of the digital economy during the pandemic. This first slide uh, delivers a very key message of the report that despite the pandemic, cross-border economic linkages within Asia and the Pacific remain robust across a variety of measures of trade, uh, finance, et cetera. Now we've seen more very recent high frequency data that suggests that due to the Omicron variant occurring uh, towards the end of 2021, that the recovery has lost some momentum. But broadly speaking, uh, Asia has, uh, the recovery has been pretty robust. Last October, we introduced an enhanced uh, measure um, of the Asia Pacific Regional Cooperation and Integration Index, uh, Archie, that uh, describes the level of integration across multiple dimensions. And in this figure, you can see uh, some of the findings. If you look at the left-hand spider web diagram, you can see that there has been significant progress in the integration in technology and digital connectivity um, in Asia. The middle uh, diagram shows uh, Asia compared to other regions of the world and you can see Asia is the blue, dark blue line. And you can see in certain areas like trade and investment, 
value chains and technology and digital connectivity, Asia is really on par with uh, the EU, which is the most integrated region um, in the world. And then finally, on the right-hand side, you can see that East Asia and Southeast Asia in particular um, have achieved higher levels of economic integration compared to other parts of the region. So um, one of the risk factors that we see going forward is the uh, financial conditions. So um, continued policy support and broadening vaccine rollouts in Asia have supported recovery in 2021, um, which buoyed the region's financial conditions. Uh, so that's why you see that the financial stress indices, um, and there's three different measures here, all show a downward trend since the second quarter of 2020. But in the most recent period, since the third quarter of 2021 with Omicron, we see that a slight uptick in the increased uh, financial uh, stress and volatility and so uh, this raises some warning flags, uh, certainly going forward. Um, one thing that has happened is that uh, because of high inflation in the West, uh, we have monetary authorities starting to signal uh, tightening of uh, monetary policy, which could uh, lead to higher interest rates. And we know that that could lead to exchange rate depreciations and uh, flows of financial flows out of the region um, if it uh, continues in that direction. So another uh, rising risk factor is the increased debt levels. And so in this figure, you can see that whether it's um, the corporate sovereign or household sectors, we see some increase in the debt levels, which creates some uncertainty. We know that with higher interest rates and higher debt levels, we could uh, encounter some uh, more debt servicing problems. And as indebted businesses face difficulties in interest and loan payments, the banking sector could experience more non-performing loan ratios. And we see this happening at least in a few countries in the diagram on the right. A weak economic recovery, deteriorating asset, deteriorating asset quality and rising non-performing loan ratios could curb new bank lending and that could further undermine the recovery so uh, governments will need to keep a careful eye on how this develops. So uh, one key message though, optimistic message is that whether we measure uh, trade by its volume or its trade or its value, we see that Asia's merchandise trade dipped less and recovered faster than global trade in 2020 and 2021. So after bottoming out in mid 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic, Asia's merchandise trade recovered particularly fast in 2021. Trade growth accelerated at double digit rates, reaching 19.1% by June 2021, before settling down to 12.4% in August 2021. Um, despite this progress, we know that globally, uh, high frequency, frequency indicators suggest that there are logistical bottlenecks that have led to supply chain disruptions globally. Um, this shows rising shipping costs, which are affected by the cost of inputs like higher oil prices. Uh, performance of, it also reflects the performance of logistics services, ports, containers, storage, inland transport, um, and as well the quarantine requirements for seafarers during the pandemic. So um, another issue affecting supply chains is geographic concentration of production. Um, and this can expose some vulnerability. For example, semiconductor chip production is kind of an extreme example of this, where you see a very complex value chain and each stage of the value chain is concentrated in a specific region of the world with uh, Western countries in the US more focused on the R&D side, uh, but then a lot of the production, 75% uh, of global installed capacity for producing chips is concentrated in East Asia. Um, so that introduces more, more possibilities for uh, a lack of coordination. So uh, a lot of the growth in Asia's intra-regional trade uh, has been rooted in uh, its linkage with the PRC. So uh, the value chain participation within Asia has been very resilient. Overall regional value chain or RVC 
participation of in the economies in the region has continued to increase in 2020 and 2019. Um, and you can see that, uh, and, and so that's the yellow and the uh, gray bars in the left-hand figure. Um, and, and you can see that uh, there's also a deepening of regional value chains um, in the complex value chain linkages, which is the yellow component on the left-hand diagram, as well as a uh, strong growth in high and medium tech sectors, which is shown on the right-hand figure. Um, uh, the biggest increase is in these green bars and uh, yellow bars on the far right. Um, we are very optimistic that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which came into force at the beginning of this year, has the potential to deepen a regional trade linkages even further. The progressive elimination of customs duties among the 15 member economies, plus um, having common rules of origin within RCEP countries uh, can foster regional value chain development. So investment in Asia and the Pacific has been uh, resilient during COVID-19, uh, despite global FDI tra trends. Um, East Asia and, the, and Southeast Asia were the main destinations in the region, attracting 80% of Asia's inward FDI. So global FDI slipped by over one third in 2020. Um, this level is nearly, uh, reached a level that was nearly 20% lower than in 2009 after the global financial crisis. Uh, developed economies felt most of the effect with a 58% contraction. Asia's intra-regional investment has been an important factor for Asia's resilience. Um, investment is expected to pick up in 2021, but recovery is still somewhat uneven. And in particular, uh, we did see a pretty big decline in greenfield uh, FDI, uh, which was compensated by an increase in M&A uh, investment uh, in Asia. So Asia has emerged as a particularly important destination for digital services FDI, which is, the, of course, the topic of our theme chapter. And that shows the resilience of uh, the pandemic. The digitalization is really transforming how firms operate and invest overseas with less need for physical presence and faster speed of business transaction. Asia really stands out as an investment hub for digital services in sectors such as telecom, computer and information services, and other business services. Since 2003, 24% of FDI into the region has gone into digital service sectors uh, especially into East Asia and South Asia. So the FDI in digital services is directly linked to uh, the development of exports. And of course, um, that's not surprising. The FDI can support the export um, sector development. Um, investment has increased in particular in sectors such as data processing, data hosting, and cloud computing, which supports the digital service exports. However, as you can see in the right-hand figure in this slide, FDI restrictions um, in Asia's digital services, such as media, legal, and professional services, remain quite high um, compared to countries not in Asia. Um, international cooperation can provide one pathway for Asia to capitalize on the increased foreign investment in digital services by informing reforms of investment incentives, as well as protection and regulatory measures. Um, this slide prevents information on remittance inflows into Asia. And in 2020, although it had originally been forecast by the World Bank to decline by 7.4%, the actual decline was only 2% in 2020. And the uh, estimates for 2021 are a recovery back to positive growth of 2.5% uh, in Asia. So um, several factors can explain the resilience of uh, remittance inflows to Asia. The first, of course, is altruism, that migrant workers um, are remitting to take care of their families who uh, were facing difficult times due to the pandemic. But also fiscal stimulus in host countries allowed migrant workers to work and remit continuously during the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated the use of digital um, channels, improving the official capture of remittance data. And tax and related incentives also encourage remittances via formal channels uh, like banks. 
So sometimes uh, remittances were even directly subsidized to attract more remittances during a time of need. Okay. Finally, um, I want to present some of the results on tourism. And not surprisingly, um, this industry has suffered a huge loss during the pandemic, um, losing about $4.5 trillion of GDP and 62 million jobs in 2020. Uh, tourism's global share of GDP declined to 5.5% 5 .5 in 2020 from 10.4% in 2019. And Asia witnessed the sharpest drop down by 90% almost. Um, and there's of course no quick fix to this. You can see in the right-hand chart that um, many Asian countries continue to implement some form of quarantine or health screening protocols that uh, restrict mobility and it'll take time and progress is undoubtedly to be uneven in safely reopening um, our borders. On top of that, there's continued unpredictability of infection outbreak, outbreaks um, and sentiment towards travel has been deeply impacted by the pandemic. Uh, so it'll be important to uh, continue to reopen, think about living with COVID in a new normal, uh, regional cooperation among economies in terms of vaccination, travel lanes, mutual recognition of vaccinations in other countries, et cetera, can all support the tourism recovery. So the decline in tourism has particularly affected, of course, tourism dependent economies. And uh, this figure shows uh, the impact in dollar terms as a percent of GDP. Uh, and uh, in per capita terms, in terms of tourism number flows. And you can see that uh, Maldives is the most hard stricken country, but more generally, a lot of the Pacific Island economies have been particularly hard hit. So uh, to wrap up, I wanna come back to the original video presentation on the theme chapter on advancing digital services trade in Asia and the Pacific. So, uh, and I just wanna highlight uh, some key messages. So um, reiterating these messages from the video, the theme chapter um, argues that to really unlock the potential of digital services trade in the region, um, governments should uh, take actions in several areas. So one uh, key drivers of digital services trade are human and physical capital, digital connectivity and the policy environment, the policy environment in particular, liberalization and deregulation of digital services trade are important. And then the regulatory framework, including cybersecurity, data protection and privacy, uh, and finally international cooperation. Let me end my presentation with some policy recommendations that flow from the, this year's uh, special theme chapter. So first, um, we need to uh, focus on investments in human capital um, and uh, deregulation and trade liberalization, uh, balancing uh, data protection and privacy issues with the importance of facilitating data flows to support digital um, services uh, development. Um, international uh, cooperation uh, can help um, to uh, help countries come to common understandings of uh, how to regulate uh, this rapidly rising sector of the economy. Um, and governments in particular need to be aware of the possibility that digital development could create digital divides. And so they should really monitor how the development of digital services and digital services trade is affecting skilled workers versus unskilled workers um, and both in urban areas and in rural areas. Um, and so, uh, especially here at the ADB, we're really always focused on how uh, reforms are going to affect the poorest members of society. Uh, so we really think uh, addressing issues of the digital divide and the dis distributional impacts of digital services trade development is quite important. So thank you very much. And maybe we can open it up to some questions. Thanks very much, Albert. Yeah, lots to think about, lots to talk about. Um, we've got about uh, 35 minutes for questions. Everybody seems to know how the Q&A box works. So that's absolutely great. 
Um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, Albert is tag teaming today with Sin Yong Park, no relation. She's the director of the Regional Co uh, Cooperation and Integration Division of Albert's Economic Research and Regional uh, Cooperation Department. Um, I, I'm seeing the, uh, the questions starting to come in. So I think let's talk about digitalization. There's a number of questions there. Uh, Warren was first out the gate, so I think he gets, uh, he gets first dibs on the question. Uh, his question is about uh, the, the Philippines um, and delayed ratification of the Regional Compre uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. Uh, he asks how that will affect digitalization in the Philippines, whether it will uh, impact that digital inequality that, uh, that you talked about, Albert, um, and whether that, you know, what impact that will have on em employment and poverty. Can I ask you to speak to that first of all? Sure. Um, well, we think, as I pointed out in the presentation, that RCEP presents opportunities for countries to find um, new opportunities in global value chains uh, that are going to be facilitated by the agreement. So it's unfortunate to delay the implementation of that agreement. At the same time, you know, the agreement just went in, into force in January on January 1st. And so I think um, its impacts are gonna be quite gradual. They will unfold over time as companies um, kind of understand and then react to uh, the changing um, opportunities. And so I don't think um, uh, companies in the Philippines or workers should feel discouraged as long as there's a commitment to get there eventually. I'm sure as the years unfold, those opportunities will also uh, be made available. Um, and that's true uh, for any country, not just the Philippines. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sin Young, anything to add to that in terms of uh, impacts on, on poverty, jobs? Well, I, I think this is a very important question. Um, the uh, RCEP, uh, in fact, uh, includes uh, two chapters that are very relevant uh, for the digitalization. It includes the chapter on e-commerce, and then it also includes a chapter on uh, intellectual uh, property rights. Uh, and then these uh, do provide a very transparent and uh, uh, internationally consistent rules on uh, the trade uh, in services and then through e uh, through e-commerce uh, as well as uh, uh, helping the investors feel more comfortable uh, in uh, going into these uh, uh, the as a member economies uh, you know, uh, for the uh, uh, protection of IPR uh, especially in the Philippines uh, this will uh, help greatly the uh, BPO sector uh, BPO sector uh, has been uh, also the uh, core business for um, you know, creating jobs and incomes for many, many people in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine government, I do believe, uh, is taking measures to uh, ratify the, uh, together with the, also the recent members. Uh, I do share the optimistic uh, sentiment uh, of uh, Albert that the RISEP uh, will provide a great potential uh, for uh, promoting uh, more active uh, employment generating the BPO sector in the Philippines. So holding firm is what you're saying, just uh, hold on and wait for it. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, there's another question here from, from Chris Dell, um, asking whether uh, this, uh, the, the, this development in digitalization in Asia, or indeed, I guess, around the rest of the world, we're all using digital services much more than we used to, whether it's, it's a COVID specific phenomenon, or is this is something that's going to be reversed post COVID, or do you think it will, will continue? The speed of digitalization definitely has accelerated during the COVID. And then uh, it did provide a lot of gains in an efficiency and also uh, increase the utilization of the digital, um, in digitally enabled platforms and then services for both businesses and the consumers. Given the uh, penet like a high penetration of uh, these uh, platform services and also a lot of uh, application that uh, show the consumers and then business is how uh, efficient and effective these can be in providing additional uh, in uh, additional uh, business opportunities and also uh, some of the uh, you know uh, the services during the uh, lockdown period it is unlikely that uh, we will uh, we will uh, 
uh, forego all these gains that we have uh, witnessed, how, how effective they can be. Uh, so uh, we all believe that the, this uh, uh, digital trend uh, will uh, likely persist uh, even post COVID. And uh, hopefully uh, this does provide a more business and an economic opportunities uh, creating more jobs and then uh, more income for uh, the, you know, people in, uh, in the region. Yeah, encouraging, encouraging. Uh, Albert. Yeah, I mean, the forces of technological change, whether it be digitalization, whether it be automation, whether it be uh, AI, these are forces which have been increasing before the pandemic and will continue to increase into the future. And uh, Xinyang is right. The pandemic accelerated the development, especially of a lot of digital services, but uh, people really now are appreciating their power, telemedicine, teleeducation, uh, work from home, communication, flexibility, you know, these things uh, we don't foresee uh, going back after the pandemic, even though the use of a few of these might decline if people can get out and be have more in person interactions, but uh, that, that's blips. These trends are powerful and will continue. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad to hear that too, personally. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, I noticed Clem, if we can move to, there's a question here from Clem, uh, which I think sort of speaks to the, you know, the same sort of topics. Um, noting that, you know, of, of course, this, this trend towards digitalization is a little bit uneven um, across the region. Um, some countries haven't yet really developed digital services. Um, where should they start? What should they do? And I think you also mentioned um, a few things that were restraining or holding back uh, digital service development in the region. Perhaps you could speak to both sort of the positives and, uh, you know, the lifting of the restrictions. Right. Well, as I mentioned, we're very con concerned uh, that, you know, this development of the digital economy is inclusive and reaches uh, broad groups of workers. And I think then it can have maximum development uh, impact. And, you know, it, it's difficult because you know, one of the points of the report was that human capital is really important. In other words, uh, the technologies often are best utilized by the most skilled workers in the economy that's highly complementary. And that's a good thing. But uh, the concern, of course, is it widens the divide if uh, the less skilled workers are and people cannot be part of that. And so being part of that doesn't necessarily mean just delivering the services. It means at least having access to the Internet, uh, so there's a lot of digital infrastructure that can really help in terms of making the digital economy more inclusive so that e-commerce is open to small enterprises and people located in remote areas so that all sorts of information flows are just much more available broadly to everybody. And so I think those should be huge uh, priority areas. But the other thing that we emphasize in the report is also, I think, key, and it's the regulatory environment because um, like many uh, cases where technology grows really quickly, it takes time for regulations to catch up and to figure out what are the issues and what is the best way to respond and you know, what are other countries doing. So it's very important for countries to communicate with each other and to also uh, be very um, uh, proactive in seeking and then implementing solutions because uh, these forces are going to be very impactful and they need to get a handle on them uh, as soon as possible. And in particular, we, you know, there's this balance between um, facilitating information flow and making it easier for digital um, um, uh, services to work. At the same time, there's all sorts of concerns about privacy, about security, um, about, um, and, and those are fair kind of policy questions but they need to be worked through and the trade-offs need to be understood. And we feel that even, in, even with all of these policy concerns, it can be done in a way that is not overly restrictive. Right now, just the simple comparison of the regulatory difficulties uh, in these or barriers in these areas show that they're still quite high in many um, Asian economies. Yeah, okay, yeah. So a, a balance really of, uh, of approach is needed there. Um, if we can shift on, um, some questions coming in about uh, semiconductor supply chains, um, noting the bottlenecks that you also mentioned in, in your report, um, asking about uh, other ways to secure stable, stable supply. 
you know, the semiconductors are a very unique sector, I think, um, uh, in that we have extreme special specialization and also it's it's highly contested now in terms of security with, uh, as we know, the US and other countries now trying to make efforts to build um, the ability to actually produce the chips, um, you know, Intel in the United States um, and um, in other parts. And it's, it's uh, I think, reflecting uh, this concern uh, that has grown during the pandemic of the need to have uh, you know, just in case inventory management, not just in time inventory management, because you never know what uh, might happen. And so to diversify supply chains. So all of that, I think, is likely to happen um, uh, and could maybe make, in some ways, make the supply chain uh, more resilient. Uh, of course, a big concern is that um, those efforts could also kind of divide supply chains. So we have a China supply chain, a US. And so it could there could be some real lost. Well, there already has been, I think, lost efficiency in the supply chains if they're viewed in a competitive um, and competitive way. So I think there will be changes. Um, and, uh, and and this is in the backdrop where because of the growth of electric cars and so many other technological changes, there's just huge increasing demand for chips. Um, and uh, there's going to need to be expanded capacity in, in, in no matter what. And so you're going to have um, that being diversified, I think, uh, in the future with the West trying to gain this fabrication capability uh, and, you know, China and other countries in the East also trying to make more progress in the, the high tech parts of the chip supply chain. And so that hopefully that will create a, a more robust and more resilient system. Anything to add uh, to that, Simeon? Um, thank you. Well, um, the uh, pandemic uh, really underscored the uh, need to um, you know, increase the resilience of the supply chain. And uh, there are uh, initially uh, a lot of uh, uh, anticipation that the supply chain uh, will be um, reconfigured to uh, have a lot of uh, reshoring uh, and then uh, onshoring. But um, the, the recent surveys and the data actually show that the reshoring, onshoring are not really uh, as uh, uh, is not really happening as uh, fast or as much as we expected. So uh, it does uh, mm, it it does actually uh, indicate that uh, you know the uh, global business community uh, still um, appreciate the uh, uh, the uh, in the supply chain that uh, that is uh, uh, really connecting uh, different countries around the world and that provides a lot of efficiency. Um, nevertheless. Uh, there are efforts uh, to increase the uh, uh, stocks for certain goods, especially the critical goods, uh, uh, the uh, some of the medical, uh, the PPEs, and then uh, critical, uh, um, the really critical components of the ones that, that um, you know, sh uh, showing some uh, the efforts to have enough stocks for that actually al uh, allows us some uh, just uh, in case. Uh, supply chain, uh, but at the same time, uh, other efforts are uh, also some. Uh, uh, the, the, we 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 also see some shift in the near shoring uh, to have uh, more. Uh, in that that's happening also the part of like a diversification of the supply chain. One thing that uh, we would uh, we shouldn't really. Uh, uh, lose the sight is the uh, use of the technology. Supply chain uh, management can use uh, a lot of new technologies and then uh, make sure that, uh, you know, it might actually even uh, move forward to the even uh, more efficient just in time uh, but like in uh, monitoring the throughout the supply chain the uh, the each production stages where this uh, where uh, suppliers are and then uh, how much the suppliers capacity is available and then how much stocks can be uh, and that uh, is the, the these type of uh, information can be uh, better shared uh, 
among the producers. And those uh, technology, uh, also using the uh, digital technology, making uh, the information sharing and then supply chain management more efficient is also another uh, trend that uh, we are witnessing in the businesses. Great stuff. Um, let's, let's broaden it out a bit. There are a number of questions here on, you know, trade more generally. Uh, can I have your comments, please, on the trade outlook for Asia and any of the big uh, things that are going to be influencing, impacting trade uh, this year and perhaps in coming years? Albert. Uh, well, broadly speaking, you know, I think the Asia region, especially parts of Asia like Southeast Asia, are, have really been highly, very dynamic economies before the pandemic and going forward. And with the RCEP agreement too, I think that's uh, bolstering that dynamism. So I think the prospects for trade are, I think should be very positive going forward broadly in the region. Uh, obviously uh, with the pandemic still uh, affecting different parts of the world with different timing, that is bound to create supply and demand mismatches. Cause you know, when a country is hit by Omicron it affects demand and it also affects supply potentially and how that's rolling around the world is unpredictable and supply chains can't react that quickly. And so there could be disruptions to trade flows along global, you know, to the supply chain issues. And we saw the, the also the graphic that um, the cost of shipping and, and whatnot because of these bottlenecks has, has increased. Um, so there's uncertainties, uh, and it, I think you need to think about uh, the trade um, structure and the COVID situation in each specific country to fully understand how the trade will be affected by the pandemic, even as we go forward. But broadly speaking, I think um, all the trends should be up despite those uh, nearer term challenges. Yeah. Sure thing. Um, we've got another couple of questions somewhat related from Mary and, and Wai Heng uh, asking about uh, financial uh, integration. Um, uh, that seems to be uh, lagging somewhat. Could you comment on that perhaps? Uh, yeah, maybe I can say a few words on that. Um, so uh, if you look at the measures of integration, the financial integration measures are relatively low in Asia compared to EU or other regions. Uh, part of that is just the lack of kind of financial development and capital market development in countries in the region, um, which um, makes it harder for people to find really high return secure uh, and secure returns to their money. Um, and that's why we see that you know, two thirds of uh, uh, funds are kind of invested uh, in non-Asian countries um, uh, as opposed to locally um, uh, by, by a, a, um, multiple metrics. Um, and that reflects, uh, a, a, and some of those funds are being put into US treasury bonds and other things that, that aren't even always such high return investments, but. Um, I think they reflect uh, the challenge of what needs to happen in Asia. And it's not, I think Asia is doing better um, in that area to develop um, more uh, financial instruments. Um, as you know, ADB has an Asian bond monitor project. And we support the development of local currency denominated bonds, which hopefully can uh, promote the financial deepening and higher returns. Uh, to holding financial assets locally. And I think there's been good progress in these types of initiatives. Um, a lot of it has to do with regulatory um, issues as well and opening up of capital accounts and these things that reflect more mature capital development. And uh, so that needs to continue and countries need to see how important, appreciate how important that is. But we recognize that, you know, some, some of these institutional changes will take some time. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, there's a question here, as I said, from Wai Heng asking about, you know, we have these different lockdowns, opening up is happening at uh, different times, at different paces in different countries. Um, if we have that uneven sort of state of play, I mean, how, what sort of impact is that going to have on economic integration, trade, FDI, foreign direct to investment, uh, labor uh, migration movements? I'll perhaps ask you, uh, Albert, and then perhaps Sin Young would like to add as well. Right. Well, 
again, I mean, as the question suggests, it's complicated. So it's hard to um, uh, give a general answer because it will, I think, depend on individual country circumstance. Broadly speaking, though, I think one thing we're optimistic about is that uh, countries are kind of learning to manage the pandemic better. So I think you see uh, fewer very extreme lockdowns um, in response to um, the pandemic. And Omicron is, with vaccination rates up and Omicron having milder health impacts, I think uh, countries uh, have been willing to reopen quick, much more quickly um, as Omicron um, kind of passes. Uh, goes up and down. And hopefully all of this learning uh, and the high vaccination rates and learning from uh, the previous experience and the cost of lockdowns is going to lead to less disruption to economic activity of the pandemic as we go forward. And I think over time, eventually, that's where we're headed because, you know, as vaccination rates really get closer to hopefully 100%, uh, you know, I think um, uh, the economic impacts of the virus will, should be quite diminished. So that's what we hope will happen. Um, but that said, uh, it's still affecting tourism. Um, and uh, it's still, um, if, it, if, if there are lockdowns, it has, it has impacts on both demand and supply, as I said, because people don't go out, they're, what they consume. Sometimes it can be good. You can buy more goods instead of services. And that has helped export recovery in Asia when that happened in the West. Um, but at the same time, if there are lockdowns, it just it hurts jobs. And we've actually seen a kind of a slow jobs recovery in Asia from, uh, from the pandemic, uh, where there's been a lot of uh, suffering in terms of incomes and job loss still um, uh, in many Asian countries. Thanks, Albert. Uh, Sinyang, anything to add? Well, broadly, uh, you know, the, what, we, uh, what uh, Albert already mentioned, general, um, cross, generally the cross-border activities that have been uh, pretty uh, severely affected uh, during the pandemic. But with the uh, Omicron, uh, there's uh, still um, um, uncertainty there's a certain or certain hope that uh, this uh, uh, turns the uh, pandemic situation to um, an endemic, uh, and uh, hoping that uh, uh, the you know the number of uh, the severe. Uh, the severe patients and the hospitalization and the fatality uh, remain manageable so that the uh, countries will not really uh, revert to the uh, uh, lockdown uh, during the early period of the pandemic. And uh, that would uh, still continue to support the economic recovery uh, and cross-border uh, economic uh, activities, uh, especially if uh, the economies uh, Take, take more caution uh, in uh, uh, you know, imposing the border control uh, rather than uh, just the doing really complete kind of uh, you know, closure. Uh, the, now the countries are really uh, trying to also, in, um, also introduce the vaccine certificates, the mutual recognition, the, the different types of the, uh, you know, the customs, uh, 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 the, you know, stand, the customs were uh, simpler uh, to, uh, compared to the past. Uh, so uh, these uh, will allow um, at least the continuity of uh, opening and then uh, economic recovery. And uh, hopefully uh, this, uh, uh, this will uh, uh, you know, continue to pave a path to the, uh, the gradual uh, safe, uh, the border opening and then economic recovery. Sure thing, thanks. Um, I want to hone in on South Asia. There's a question here from uh, Amy, uh, noting that, uh, uh, that, that South Asia might have uh, the opportunity to benefit more from regional integration, not least because of its uh, service digitalization. We, we know that there's a lot going on in, in that part of the world, but also that South Asia has hitherto been uh, one of the least integrated subregions uh, in Asia and the Pacific, certainly less integrated than Southeast Asia. Um, so any, any insights on South Asia's future, how it can capture the benefits of regional, integrated, regional integration? 
uh, currently the biggest challenge in Southeast, South Asia uh, for uh, capitalizing on the opportunities from digitalization would be really the digital divide. Um, uh, in terms of the also the uh, ICT infrastructure, the you know the uh, uh, the really um, accessible, affordable, and then uh, um, the quality uh, ICT infrastructures are not really evenly distributed across uh, South Asia. And uh, uh, South South Asia is uh, um, one of the really um, uh, one of uh, the sub regions the most um, digitally divided, <laughs> uh, and then uh, have a higher uh, uh, inequality. And a lot of these uh, social economic inequalities are um, really well kind of, uh, you know, correlated with this uh, digital divide. Uh, there are the digital divide, the rural versus uh, urban, there's a digital divide, even like, you know, the uh, gender, the age, and then uh, in, apart from it, just simple uh, income. Uh, so the uh, for, um, the uh, this is a similar to what Albert already said about like uh, uh, the countries that are not really uh, digital uh, that that are not really developed in the digital services digital trade yet they should really strengthen the investment investment in the digital connectivity investment in the human capital they have to uh, you know promote the digital awareness literacy um, uh, among uh, all the uh, in all segments of the society um, and uh, they should also try to strengthen the digital education through uh, the comprehensive the uh, school curricula uh, south asia has been also quite uh, heavily affected uh, during the lockdown for school from school closures, uh, it's uh, uh, there are uh, there have been uh, you know numerous reports that uh, you know that because that the South Asia did not really have access to online, the uh, they uh, many kids were out of school and then uh, even uh, couldn't really benefit from the uh, online schooling. So uh, these uh, uh, these pose a significant risk to actually the uh, even further gap in the future in terms of the productivity and then income. Uh, the government should really uh, you know take extra measures to make sure that the uh, you know the kids get the proper education uh, if uh, and where uh, possible. Uh, the strengthen the digital curricula in the uh, uh, in the regular uh, school uh, programs as well. That's, thanks, Inyong. If I can come to you, Albert, um, because I'm seeing here a question from Jane, which is very much related to that, uh, and uh, you can perhaps comment on it, uh, asking whether every single subregion does have the opportunity to, uh, to benefit from digitalization, whether they will be able to find their export niche, or whether it's really just confined to India uh, and some of the other South Asian countries, as Sinyong uh, alluded to, or, and, and or perhaps the Philippines. Is there enough to go around? In right. Uh, well, you know, uh, leaning on my training and as, econom as an economist, I think we believe that uh, integration and trade should provide net gains for everyone so that there's always uh, ways that you can gain from comparative advantage. Um, and so I think uh, digital services development has enormous potential of just contributing to growth. And then this kind of related, so, you know, that's certainly true in a place like India and other places that have already well-developed digital services like call centers and whatnot. But it's also true for rising uh, manufacturing activity, let's say in Bangladesh, where it's a kind of a, a, a reasonably robust kind of uh, manufacturing sector, and then, uh, and that's also happening to some extent in India, because digital service, digital services used by businesses and digitalization of production and trade really can boost opportunities for small and medium scale enterprises as well. You know, re reflecting work that you know we've been also doing on the development of SMEs, um, and so I think it can it, it can help everybody to some extent. Obviously. There's always concern about um, about in terms of trade integration that some countries, you know, will get benefit more than other countries, and, and some sectors, if they're open to competition, could get hurt. And so those are general features of trade, and uh, and so also features of digital services trade. 
But broadly speaking, you know, if South Asia scores, ver scores very low on regional integration and broadly regional integration is, you know, positive for growth, then uh, just by being at a lower base, in some sense, there's more potential for gains in the region if they can promote greater integration. Of course, that also depends kind of on the complementarity of the economic activities across the countries that are being integrated. Um, but I think broadly still that that's true. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we've only got five minutes left and I do want to squeeze in a couple more questions if I could. The question from Vivi is asking about the economic growth prospects for uh, micro and small enterprises, generally speaking, but perhaps also in the context of, of digitalization. What um, are the opportunities for them sure. there? Well, um, thank you. Um, well, uh, MSMEs uh, often face uh, greater sort of uh, barriers and then challenges uh, you know, um, in many, uh, many aspects. And then uh, actually one of the top sort of uh, uh, the challenges uh, usually on uh, uh, also financing. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, um, the SME finance has been the uh, biggest challenge in many uh, countries. And then uh, most of the surveys actually show like it's one of the top uh, barriers to uh, SME need to grow. Uh, and uh, during the uh, pandemic, especially the uh, SME's uh, participation in trade has been uh, also greatly affected by lack of trade finance. Again, the uh, financing uh, is a major challenge. Um, but with the uh, digital technologies, there have been a lot of uh, advances uh, in uh, you know, the, uh, also, you know, improving the efficiencies of the uh, um, also the, um, the finance uh, the financial management from the bank processing those loans to the SMEs. SMEs could also uh, introduce more digital uh, technology, being able to manage more effectively and then, then lower their cost and then also participate in trade, uh, as well as uh, you know, reduction in trade costs. Uh, and the ADB has been providing quite a lot of support also in terms of the trade and supply chain finance. Um, and uh, uh, this, these are uh, uh, one of the areas that I believe that SMEs do have a very uh, strong uh, growth potential. Uh, if you uh, look at some of the examples, like actually quite a lot of examples, uh, but uh, in China especially, you know, there's uh, uh, the uh, big e-commerce uh, platform allows many, many, many small uh, the uh, SMEs and then the you know small like uh, farmers being able to sell their products right on the uh, online site and being able to participate. Uh, in the, the you know, digital market uh, place uh, directly with the consumers. Uh, and uh, these uh, type of uh, platform uh, businesses can be, uh, uh, um, can be more facilitated and then developed in many economies where we can actually uh, broaden the digital connectivity and then the, uh, you know, the people's uh, uh, you know, use and then awareness of the, these uh, potential uh, the platform, uh, the, uh, the platform businesses. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Sin Young. I do notice that we're perilously close to the top of the hour. I had wanted to get to so many more questions. There are a lot of really, really great questions coming in. So I apologize that we didn't manage to, to get to all of them, but we are unfortunately out of time. So I do want to thank uh, everybody for joining us today, for sending in the questions. It's a big topic. We were never going to get to everything in one hour, unfortunately, but I do want to um, thank you, uh, Albert. Uh, Albert Park, Chief Economist um, uh, here at the Asian Development Bank. Sin Young Park, Director of the Regional Cooperation and Integration uh, Division. Just to say that the full uh, Asian, Asian Economic Integration Report is on the adb.org website. Uh, it's on the homepage, very, very visible. Um, we'll also be posting our Albert's PowerPoint uh, and the full video online in short order. So if you miss anything, um, please do look out for it there. Uh, please do also join us on the 23rd of February for our next Asian Impact webinar when we'll be talking about the sustainability of Asia's debt with, uh, again, uh, some ADB uh, experts and also some external experts as well. That's at 10 a.m. Manila time, same time, same place. Join us then. Thank you very much. <laughs>